welcome to the Adventures with Grammy podcast. I am your host, Carolyn Berry. This podcast is for grandparents on the go with their grandchildren and for parents who want to ensure loving relationships across the generations. I welcome your feedback and your input on every episode of the podcast we produce. Please send me an email, carolyn at adventureswithgrammy.com. Now sit back with your favorite beverage and enjoy today's episode. This episode of the Adventures with Grammy podcast has two guests. For our first segment, Literacy, our guest is Dr. Dawn Menge. She is the award-winning author of the series Queen Vernita. For our adventures and our grandparenting segments, our guest is Richard Haydock, the author of the book, Shifting Gears, 50 Baby Boomers Share Their Meaningful Journeys Through Retirement. Richard will share the activities that they embarked on after they retired, and he will share memories of his grandparents and the activities that he enjoys with his own four grandsons. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dawn Menge and her mother, Virginia Rhodes. Dawn is the author of numerous books in the Queen Vernita series. Queen Vernita lives in the kingdom of Oceaneer and is lonely. Each of the books takes the queen outside of her castle for a year-long journey. She meets a new friend every month, and each friend gives her seven facts about that part of Queen Vernita's kingdom. Dawn teaches children with severe cognitive delays. She began writing this award-winning series as part of a class for her credentialing. Welcome Dawn and welcome Virginia to the Adventures with Grammy podcast. Let's begin by your telling us a little more about your book, how it got started, and the characters in it. It started with an assignment in my credentialing class. I was taking a math class and she asked us to uh, write a book on math skills and to make a board game. So the very original book, I actually put my students in it. It was called Queen Victoria's Visitors and all of my students were in the book. And we traveled around the high desert and did a little skit to the uh, pre-K to second graders. And then I would go back the next day and explain our, my students' behaviors, uh, what we were doing. When I decided to publish the book, I made Queen Vernita, who was my grandmother, and she's Queen Vernita. And then everybody in the book was uh, someone in my family because most of them were the children. So I figured the children wouldn't complain and it would be okay. But that was the only book I was actually publishing. I just wanted to publish it. Um, But I immediately started, I got first place in the Evie Award, which is out of Colorado. And I started getting interviews and they started asking me like, what's your next book? What are you going to write on? And I didn't have any plans. So I love to travel, and that came from my grandmother and my mother. We decided that the queen was going to travel around her kingdom and learn about the different areas. And so that's what she started doing. So, And all of it's based on my real travels and my real adventures. So I have two books from Kona. I have a friend that lives there that I grew up with. So we go there a lot, and we held baby alligator, or I'm sorry, baby seahorses and swam with the turtles and went swimming with the sharks in a shark cage and swam in lava tubes. And I have one on Alaska and I went with my mom and we uh, kayaked to glaciers and snorkeled in Sitka. And then I have, uh, which do I have? I have the one with my brother who is the astronomer. I have one that goes up the coastline of California and we learn about tide pools and swim with octopus. I also have one on Baja, California, and she rides a quad down the beach and goes to a German eatery and learns some of the uh, local dances. And right now I am getting ready to publish. They're working on the book. Uh, we usually take a yearly trip to Halama Beach. It's on the, in the central coast of California and with my family. So that one's pre-K to first grade and she's camping on the beach. And so she learns how to fly kites and eat s'mores, learns to body surf and surf. And I'm also doing one out of Tucson, Arizona at a, my one of my favorite bed and breakfast there. And she's learning all about the desert of Tucson. Virginia, how did your mother, Vernita, feel about being featured in her granddaughter's books? She was a great lady. 
she was very excited about them. Uh, she was a world class traveler. And when the books first came out, she traveled with us to libraries so that we could read the book and help the kids with a little art project to go along with the books. And she really was excited about that. So each one of Don's books originated from a travel that we did. Would you read an excerpt from one of your books for us? I'm going to have my mom read the very first book. And it's just based on the activities that they do around the castle. When I first started doing this, I tried to make everybody's page on their birthday, their birthday month. So her birthday is in September. So she's going to read her September page. September is apple picking time. For the whole 30 days, they picked apples and made delicious smelling food for all the village people. On Mondays, they made apple pies. On Tuesdays, they made apple tarts. On Wednesday, they ate applesauce. On Thursdays, they ate the apples right off the trees. On Fridays, they made apple fritters. On Saturdays, they made baked apples. On Sundays, they made cinnamon apple cakes. On the 30th day of September, the whole village gathered to say goodbye to Virginia. We will miss your wonderful apple desserts. We will count all 12 months until you return. Where can our listeners find you and where can they find your books? I have a website, Dr. Don Menge. Uh, my books are also on my publisher site, Rushmore Press. I'm, of course, um, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, Walmart. I have a Facebook, uh, Don Menge One. I also have a Twitter and an Instagram, and anywhere there you can find links to my books. <music> My guest today is Richard Haydock, who is the author of the book, Shifting Gears, 50 Baby Boomers Share Their Meaningful Journeys in Retirement. These boomers are on exciting journeys. And Richard, I am so glad you're here to tell us about these incredible people. What actually inspired you to write the book? I was hearing so many interesting stories from my colleagues about different things they were doing in their retirement to kind of reinvent themselves and get a whole new life in retirement. What did you discover as you wrote the book that surprised you? Family was a huge, huge part of almost every person I interviewed. They all had connections to family along with some other kind of thing they had going on. And it was always a very special uh, part of their, uh, the joy of their retirement. One lady in particular, her story spanned four generations. She was involved with a school that had, uh, it was a preschool, and it had a really interesting set of values. So one of the things they thought all preschoolers should do is go play in a creek and get all muddy and get all that kind of stuff. And also to look at growing things and cooking with them. And these are preschoolers and that the only people they would allow in the school had to have parent involvement where they showed up and monitored what the kids were doing with these various activities. So this school went through, has been around since the 50s. Um, This lady was involved as a teacher in her younger days. And then her daughter, her daughter's daughter, and now her great granddaughter have all been part of the school. Three of them have been involved in the administration of the school. And of course, the great granddaughter is now a a student at the school and she's in a preschool uh, group there. And Jane had been doing this for a long time on kind of a part-time basis, but became kind of the go-to person within this school. They would all come to her and say, uh, what should we do about this? And what's the right way to handle that? And she said, it was time for me to go. I wanted to let these people grow in their responsibilities. Uh, So she said it was time to retire. And then as she was retiring, she was saying, but I want to leave a legacy here. This school meant so much to four generations of my family. I didn't want it to come come apart. And so she started investigating what are the critical things that the school faces as challenges. Um, some of the parks that they were taking the kids to play in had gone on to do other things and they were renting out the park for different facilities for a wedding reception or whatever. And they didn't want these little kids playing in the Creek. So they were constantly trying to find new places where the kids could go. They had a staffing problem. They had a financial problem. They had a, 
uh, physical facility problem. Uh, and she said, what we needed to do was just look at this as the critical things that this school needed to do to survive and thrive and continue to serve uh, young preschoolers. Um, and so she's been the person that's been kind of the driving force to say, how do we make this into something that will always be here? And, and she's committed this next stage of her life after having been a teacher there to now being the person who drives the sustainability of it. So it, it's just a great, great story. And the look in her eye when she's telling this story about her kids, her grandkids and her great grandkids was just something to behold. And because the school requires the parent to monitor the child, they have to write something up. So she now has uh, three generations of write-ups of one of their kids that was in the school. And she said, when you go back to those and compare your kid to your grandkid to your great-grandkid, she said, it's just remarkable to see. Tell us about John and Ellen and their farm. John and Ellen use location as the source of a new adventure. So they were they decided to go to Alaska for a while, and they did that. And um, they moved to Pennsylvania and got a farm there, a 75-acre farm. And they started growing or started raising these sheep because of the. Uh, they said, "Well, we can do this as kind of a side hobby, and it'll be kind of fun, and the animals are kind of cute, and we can make a, make a few dollars to add to our retirement." And this farm became kind of a grandkid magnet, as you can imagine. So the kids could come up to the farm, uh, spend the day or spend a week uh, at the farm, collect the eggs in the morning, feed the animals, uh, go out and play with the sheep, all that sort of thing. John and Ellen kind of got to the point of saying, it's too intermittent. There's too much of the life of my grandkids that I'm missing because it's a four hour drive from where the grandkids are to where uh, the grandparents are. That coincided with them getting a little bit older and uh, they described what it takes to wrestle a sheep to the ground when you have to give it a medication or whatever. I've got a bad back now, I can't do that anymore. And they described a story where, where the sheep had kicked uh, Ellen in the knee and she had to get her knee kind of all fixed up. And, and they finally came to the conclusion, we can't do this at a physical level at this age but we don't want to do it being so far from the grandkids. So they've made the decision uh, to move to a place that's uh, less than an hour away from their grandkids. The, uh, and that's a much smaller one where they're gonna board horses rather than have sheep, but they're gonna take the ducks and the chickens and that kind of stuff along because the kids love um, uh, interacting with the animals. And they're in this process of saying, you know, it's time to get closer to the kids, uh, to the grandkids, because one of the grandkids is doing a recital. They want to be there in the audience for it. And when they get together at holidays, they want to get together on a much more regular basis. What was fascinating about the story to me was one of their kids made this happen. The, the uh, John and Ellen had said, well, yeah, that might be kind of interesting. And then one of their sons just went out, found a property, started negotiating on the property, brought uh, uh, John and Ellen into the, into the process, obviously, and just persisted to make it happen because he so much wanted his kids to have a relationship with their grandparents. And it's going to be a new grandparenting relationship uh, with some kids that they've just been really close with, but now they're going to be close with them on a much more frequent basis and still have this kind of joy of the farm that the kids can come visit and see. So it's just, it's a heartwarming story to me. It's, it's great to see them all so committed to, uh, to that relationship at all three, at all three generations. You also interviewed Eleanor, who wanted to be closer to her grandchildren and moved as well. Her um, family was in Portland, and she was on the East Coast, and she had a, a couple of things that combined into that. She wanted to be closer to her family. There was, She said, I want to be close to the grandkids. And she said, I don't have any grandkids yet, but I'm about to have, my, have the first one, so it's time to move out to, uh, to Portland. And then she combined that with a desire to be doing some things in the outdoors. She became very much involved in a lot of conservation kinds of projects. Her grandparenting 
grandparenting relationship is more prospective, um, but she knows that's going to be important to her. And she wanted to be in the same town as, as the grandchild when it's born. I like the story of Andy and his wife who say their retirement is grandchild centric and they like exploring the United States in their RV. At least one week out of the year, they take their grandchildren on a skip generation road trip. Yeah, and it's very, they live in the same town with the grandkids, so they see them pretty regularly, but, but they do a, a, an RV trip with them uh, without the parents. So it's the grandparents and the grandkids without the, without the parents. Um, and they really have a, a kind of a bonding experience. Um, it turns out that an RV gets kind of small for four people uh, when, you know, two of them are, are young and, and uh, lively and all that sort of thing. So they, they have a time limit for how long they can do that. I think, I think a week is about their record, um, but it's a joyful experience for them. Um, and at the end of it, they're just exhausted. <laughs> they're just worn out, uh, but in a good way. Uh, and that's, that's been an important part of their retirement. I also asked Richard to tell me his memories of his grandparents. I was just talking with someone this morning, and, and the, the question was, what do you remember about the food that your grandparents gave you? And that sounds kind of trivial, but I remember visiting my grandparents um, uh, in the Bronx in New York, and my grandmother would get up before any of us every morning, and she would make these wonderful apple turnovers. And... I could smell them while I was awakening and I can still smell them. I can, I, sitting here right now, I can, I can remember that. And my grandmother was so pleased to be pleasing us that, that it really became a very special kind of thing. One grandfather I never knew. My one grandmother was very ill and very old. My parents had me when I was fairly, when they were fairly old. So my grandparents were kind of in their eighties. We never did what I would call active grandparent, grandkid kinds of things. We would have conversations and those were very special, but I never felt that close to my grandparents because we didn't do stuff. We, we would just kind of sit there and we'd have conversations, but that was kind of the limit of it. Um, I can't remember a single time when we even went to a movie together or that we took a walk around the block. They were, they, were, they were old and they had a lot of infirmities and we were more visiting as a courtesy rather than as an activity. And that sounds kind of awful, but it was kind of the, the way it was. One of the consequences of that too is I have wanted to, and my wife has wanted to stay very close to our grandkids and we do. We, we do a lot of stuff with them. There's, there's four grandkids, so they're all boys. And uh, two are kind of teenagers now, and the other two are like 12 and 14. Instead of buying them presents at Christmas and that sort of thing, we invest in relationship building and memory building kinds of activities. Um, some of that is around travel. When we had our 50th anniversary, we had a casual question to my kids, would you rather go off on a great trip together or have an inheritance? Um, and they all voted right. They said, let's go off and do a great, great trip together. So we went off to Africa on safari with all of the kids and all the grandkids and just had a, a, a tremendous time. We spent some time trying to climb Mount Kilimanjaro together. We spent time on safari. And then uh, at the end of the trip, we went off to the beach in Zanzibar and stayed there for a couple of days. And that was, that was really a, a great, great trip. We had another trip with the kids where we went backpacking up in Oregon and we had all four of the grandkids and then uh, one daughter and her son and the other uh, daughter and, and son, son-in-law could not make it. So we went off and just went backpacking together and, and just had a great time off in the woods together for several days. This has been fascinating, Richard. Thank you. Where can our listeners find you and find your book? The book is on all the major uh, booksellers now. It's both an ebook and a, a hardcover. And again, it's Shifting Gears. 50 Baby Boomers Share Their Meaningful Journeys in Retirement. Uh, I have a website, richardhayduck.com. It's H-A-I-D-U-C-K.com. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Adventures with Grammy podcast. If you did, I would like for you to do two things for me. One, hit the subscribe button. 
so that you don't miss any episodes of the podcast and ask your family members and friends to do the same. The second thing is to visit the website adventureswithgrammy.com and look on the menu bar and click on the link newsletter sign up. That will give you access to my monthly newsletter. Also, ask your family members and friends if they will sign up too. Please feel free to contact me, carolyn at adventureswithgrammy.com, with any comments or suggestions. 